I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's October 26th, and we have a lot to talk about. Usually, it's enough to just talk about multiple sclerosis on this podcast. But today, we're literally talking about more than that, because research shows that about 50% of the people living with MS will also deal with another chronic health condition in their lifetime. And that other condition, called a comorbidity, makes managing MS harder than it otherwise has to be. My guest today is Dr. Alyssa Willis, an associate professor and chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and we're talking about comorbidities and MS. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Willis, there are a few other things that you should know about. One thing that a lot of people are talking about is the new documentary about Selma Blair. In fact, it's something that a number of you have been asking me to talk about, and as I've said in my email replies, I didn't want to talk about it until I had a chance to actually watch the documentary. And now I have. So, let me share my thoughts about it with you. And I have to say that I've really struggled with this for a couple of reasons. But first and foremost, as someone who's watched their loved one battle a set of severe and progressive MS symptoms, I appreciate Selma Blair's bravery and determination to share her story. I know it wasn't easy for her, nor is this documentary easy for the audience to watch. For people who may only know someone whose MS symptoms are invisible, this is going to be an eye-opener, and in that respect, The film certainly achieves its goal of raising awareness. I think that when a celebrity does something like this, it's almost a double-edged sword. Film producers certainly haven't been knocking on the doors of the more than one million people across the U.S. who are living with MS, hoping to make a feature documentary about their MS journey. So I see being a celebrity as a requirement for this sort of film to even be made. At the same time, Because Selma Blair is a celebrity, many aspects of her life are unique. They exist only because she's a celebrity, and that makes her MS journey a little different, doesn't it? We like to say that each person living with MS is an expert on their MS, and so I don't take anything away from Selma Blair for being an expert on her MS. My only concern is is that Selma Blair isn't an expert on stem cell therapy for MS, and some of the things that have been presented, either in the film itself or in comments that she shared with the media while promoting the film, well, I worry that some of those statements might create some degree of false hope for someone who may be wondering whether this same treatment is the right treatment for them. For instance, in her interview on Nightline, some of which was also shown on Good Morning America, Selma says that her neurologist told her that she'd regain 90% of her function within a year following her stem cell transplant. And that just doesn't sound like anything a neurologist would ever try to predict. In fact, in the film itself, we see Dr. Richard Burt, who was responsible for Selma Blair's stem cell transplant at Northwestern University, we see him remind her that it may be a couple of years before she sees any sort of improvement. And since a few of you have even asked me where Selma Blair had her stem cell transplant, I should probably mention that shortly after she announced that she had received a stem cell transplant, Northwestern abruptly shut down the program, and Dr. Burt has been on sabbatical ever since. Now, I'm not trying to imply any sort of cause and effect here, but if you're interested in investigating this procedure, I just want you to know that it won't be done at the hospital that treated Selma Blair. In the documentary, I was happy to see that Selma's initial follow-up MRI exam revealed no new lesions. That's always great news. And by the end of the documentary, when Selma appears to be doing better, I was kind of surprised that there was no mention of the possibility of the placebo effect. Now, the placebo effect is a well-known and well-proven phenomenon, 
in which a patient's response to a treatment has absolutely nothing to do with the actual treatment, but with the patient's belief that the treatment is going to work. And I'll admit that when I watched Selma Blair dance down the hospital hallway, twirling her cane like a baton, just nine days after receiving her stem cell transplant, the words placebo effect flashed in my mind. And those words were only reinforced when we see Selma return home to Los Angeles, and she doesn't seem to be doing nearly as well, so much so that she's feeling pretty frustrated. But watching the documentary and then seeing Selma do her more recent round of media interviews, it at least appears that she's experienced some symptom progression. And if it turns out that this treatment hasn't been as effective as we all hope, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not necessarily an issue with the treatment itself. Just a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Jeffrey Cohen from the Cleveland Clinic joined me on episode 215 of Real Talk MS, And one of the things we discussed was the profile of an ideal patient for this procedure. Autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or AHSCT, the procedure that Selma Blair actually received, is recommended for people under the age of 50 who've had relapsing remitting MS for less than 10 years and haven't been responsive to disease-modifying therapies. We don't hear much about that in the documentary, except when Selma's manager shares that she tried a medication, and I want to quote from him now because it made me sit up. He said, she went down and the paramedics had to bring her back. Well, I don't know if anyone who's been on a disease-modifying therapy, even someone who's experienced side effects associated with DMTs, I don't know if anyone knows what he's trying to describe. And Selma shares that she first noticed her MS symptoms directly following the birth of her son. So it's conceivable that Selma Blair has been living with MS for more than 10 years. It's been shown that having a higher level of disability can negatively affect the outcome of this treatment. And we also know that this procedure hasn't been effective in treating people living with progressive MS. Does Selma Blair have progressive MS? Well, that information isn't shared in the documentary, nor has Selma shared it on Instagram. Hopefully, that's not the case. So, I guess my only real takeaway from having watched Introducing Selma Blair is that it's a heart-wrenching, honest portrayal of Selma Blair's very difficult MS journey. And my only worry is not so much about what Selma Blair or the documentary says, but about the way our society sometimes elevates celebrity. Personally, I think everyone should be like Selma Blair in becoming an expert in their MS and avoid assuming that the treatment for Selma Blair's MS or the outcome of Selma Blair's stem cell transplant will be the best treatment or outcome for you, even if no one wants to make a movie about it. If you'd like to learn more about the National MS Society's recommendation of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, for certain people living with relapsing remitting MS, and see if it might be something for you and your neurologist to consider, well, you can visit nationalmssociety.org slash A-H-S-C-T, and you'll find that link in today's show notes. I should also mention that I've spent two years trying to bring Selma Blair onto the podcast, but so far, no luck. Selma, if you're listening you have a standing invitation to join me for some real talk about your MS, your treatment, and your documentary. October signals the start of the MS Research Conference season, and this week, the Consortium of MS Centers is hosting its annual meeting. I'm taking in the virtual presentations, and you can look forward to getting a full report. But the other thing that happens during these conferences is there are a number of symposia or other presentations that aren't actually part of the conference. But the companies, individuals, and organizations that plan these other presentations take advantage of the fact that a lot of MS clinicians and researchers are going to be in the same place, so the timing makes sense. But in one case, I'd suggest that the optics don't make very good sense. 
There's a symposium featuring three outstanding MS researchers who also have clinical practices, so they see people living with MS all the time. The symposium is titled Multiple Sclerosis Management, Shedding Light on the Patient Perspective. And this one-hour event will feature a review of data collected from 360 MS patients about a variety of MS management issues related to their care. I think it's a great topic. It's a topic that should be getting more attention, should require more attention. But if you're going to shed light on the patient perspective, shouldn't you include at least one patient in the program? Now, in this case, I realize that data from a few hundred MS patients will be shared, and that's great. But it's really not the same as having someone there, in person, sharing their perspective. There are plenty of times and plenty of programs when this happens. But it doesn't always happen. And when it doesn't, I think the presentation loses something. As MS clinical practice and MS research strive to become more patient-centric, I hope presentations at MS research conferences will follow the same trend. Julie Stam was diagnosed with MS in 2007. She's a patient advocate with a powerful voice, and Julie is the author of Some Days, A Tale of Love, Ice Cream, and my mom's chronic illness. The book was inspired by many of the real-life moments Julie shared with her son, Jack. It's a wonderful book, and it can really help parents explain MS or really most any other chronic illness to a young child. Welcome to the podcast, Julie. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Full disclosure, Julie and I have met a few times at various functions and events, but I really haven't seen Julie since she became a published author. So congratulations and thank you. Thank for, you. Well, thank you for sharing some of your moments with Jack with the rest of us. Oh, thanks. And there have been many since. So I, I have to start working on book three. <laughs> well, I should explain that because this is a children's book, The full page illustrations are an important part of the book. And I want to give equal congratulations to Shamisa Kellogg, who illustrated the book. I I just think the visual style of the book tells the story perfectly. It was wonderful working with her because I had a very clear vision of what I wanted. And she had no problem bringing it to life, which was awesome. Well, before we get to your book, I'd like to go back for a moment to when you were diagnosed in 2007. What was your life about then and how did things change? It was completely, I didn't live, I lived in London when I was diagnosed and I was working in finance, just a totally different girl that I was a girl then I was young, I was 27. So, you know, 15 years now, it'll be in January. I look back and I'm like, oh, how did I not see that? How did I not go to doctors sooner? Um, Why did I wait so long? You know, um, and it took years. It took six years to get diagnosed from my first symptom that I And even before that, now I look back and I wish I listened to my body a bit more and was a bit more of my own advocate. Um, I think that now here we are. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's such a common exercise that everyone who's diagnosed with MS does. We start retrospectively going through our, our, our past history, trying to identify that moment, right? Yeah. And it's, it's crazy because, and then it's something that we do is we sometimes blame symptoms that aren't MS related when you once you're diagnosed on MS. So you have to realize it doesn't always have to be MS and it might not have always, but looking back, I do, you know, there are things, wow, that wasn't a normal feeling at that age to, you know, have tingling or feeling like bugs are crawling up my body or, you know, all those symptoms that you'd go to the doctor and they're like, Oh, you're just overheating. It's prickly heat. I'm like, well, it's going on for years now. So. And how are you doing now? I am in a clinical trial, which I'm very fortunate to be a part of. Um, my walking has improved, which is very exciting. Um, you wouldn't, I, I have to say, I, by looking at me, I, I have an invisible illness, but every day is a fight. Every step is like, okay, left leg up, left leg up, left leg up. You know, um, it, I'm, I think we fight hard to make it look easy, but um, every day is certainly a challenge for sure. Well, let's get into your book now. I'm curious, what made you want to write a book? Um, It's really, my son kind of changed how I looked at it. So these pages, I always tell people when they get the book to read it on your own first before you read it to your child, 
because if you are someone with a chronic illness, you can kind of see the battle behind the mom in the book. Um, and that's where my son stepped in is these are the pages that I would cry myself to sleep. These are the days that I failed as a mom because of MS. Um, but when I sat down and talked to my son, he didn't see them that day. He saw them as great adventures. And so it kind of fully transformed my whole outlook on how I mothered and how much guilt I carried with having MS and being a mom. So what does your son, Jack, think of the book? He loves it. He He's he's blonde, so he's not happy. He's brunette in this version. Because I initially, we self-published the first version. And it was almost identical to him. Uh, you know, the little boy is him and the mom looks just like me. But when we got picked up by a traditional publishing house, we tried to make it more encompassing of, you know, everyone, which was awesome, but he doesn't see it as him anymore. <laughs> so, um, but he, he still loves it, which is good. I think he's sick of hearing about it by now. <laughs> because it's, it's a big part of our life. Well, outside of uh, Jack, uh, who I'm confident is one of your biggest, if not the biggest uh, literary critic, how's the book been received? What kind of feedback are you hearing? Oh, it's been great. Um, the best thing is um, getting from parents that are just telling their children about having a chronic illness and them using it as a tool. Um, Cause I, I'm a big believer in it's important to be honest with our kids from as early as we feel comfortable. I always wanted to be very honest and I didn't want him to wake up when he's 15 and realize my mom's been keeping this secret for me for my entire life. So I love that I'm getting letters and emails about people using it as a tool and how their kids find comfort in it um, when their parents are having bad days. And we're getting major feedback from like Selma Blair, Linda Carter, Montel Williams, a bunch of different people, which is very exciting. I'm sorry if I missed any major ones, but um, yeah. And the thought that, you know, Selma Blair said that she reads it to her son and he still finds comfort in it and he's a little bit older is very um, rewarding to me because for me, I thought it was just for my son's age. When I wrote it, it was really just for him to have when he grows up as a book to reflect on. Um, so the fact that it's, you know, been in multiple countries and, you know, people in India have reached out to me, people in Australia and Asia is very rewarding. Well, before you wrote this book, you were a patient advocate. What's important to yeah. you about advocacy? So even though it's only almost 15 years, it, we didn't really have the internet the way we have it now. Like we did, I just didn't, I didn't have a computer at home. So I couldn't like Google everything the way that we did, you know, now everything's very accessible and you could get on zoom and you can connect, you know, I can talk to you right now at wherever you are in the world, you know, it's, it's a different world, but I don't want anyone to ever feel alone. Um, and I think I'm very, we're very fortunate that newly diagnosed, there are so many supports for them. But I think showing them that, you know, this isn't the disease that if you type in multiple sclerosis on the internet, you're not, it's not the disease it once was. Um, it's, it's very different. And the treatment options are, there's so many more. We just, we're advancing. So I think when you look on the internet, meet more people that are actually living it day to day, as opposed to just reading words, um, find the people that are going to give you the support. Cause the network is the most important thing. I think um, that has gotten me through the bad days. Well, now that you have this very special children's book under your belt, what's next? The second one, um, the transcript is already done. So that's good. And I'm working on the third one now, which is exciting. Where can people yeah. find their own copy of Some Days, A Tale of Love, Ice Cream, and My Mom's Chronic Illness? So we, um, it is officially available October 26th. And it, it's on Amazon for pre-order now. And you can get it there. But it should be at your local bookshops and libraries, hopefully very soon. Julie and her publisher have been gracious enough to offer a copy of the book to one of our listeners. So let's make this easy. Send me an email. The email address is john, J-O-N, at realtalkms.com. Just send me an email with some days as the subject line. We'll do a random drawing at the end of this week, and the winner will receive a free copy of Julie's book, just in time for the holidays. I'll go ahead and announce the winner of the drawing on next week's episode of Real Talk MS. Julie Stamm, thank you for giving parents a wonderful tool for explaining MS to a young child. And thanks for talking with me today. Oh, John, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to see you again. Speaking of stem cells, as we've discussed on previous episodes of Real Talk MS, 
there are a number of important clinical trials currently taking place to determine how to best optimize stem cell therapy for MS. And these trials are looking at different kinds of stem cells as well. Selma Blair's treatment used hematopoietic stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are another type of adult stem cell found in a variety of tissues, including bone marrow, fat tissue, and even the umbilical cord. And there are several different clinical trials underway exploring different approaches to using mesenchymal stem cells to treat MS. Now, these stem cells have the ability to migrate to the central nervous system, and in preclinical studies, they've been shown to modulate the immune system, dampen inflammation, protect neural cells from damage, and even promote remyelination. And a large clinical trial using mesenchymal stem cells derived from bone marrow has just reported that while the treatment proved to be safe and well-tolerated, after 24 weeks, it failed to reach its endpoint. It failed to impact the number of gadolinium-enhancing lesions among the trial participants. So, scientists learned one way that mesenchymal stem cells derived from bone marrow don't seem to work as a treatment for MS, and that's really important information. Whenever I read about a clinical trial that falls short, I'm reminded of what Thomas Edison said when someone asked him how it felt to fail 10,000 times while he was trying to invent the electric light bulb. Edison replied, Fail? I didn't think of it that way. I thought I was discovering 10,000 ways not to create a light bulb. And that's a great example of how failure propels science forward. Now, if you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find the link in today's show notes. And please don't take this news about one mesenchymal stem cell clinical trial to heart. Two weeks ago at the Ectrams conference, researchers presented the outcome of another clinical trial using mesenchymal stem cells that were derived from bone marrow. And this trial showed success in study participants who were living with progressive MS. And to those of you who are wondering why stem cell therapy for MS is still considered experimental, I think these very different outcomes in two clinical trials, both using mesenchymal stem cells, perfectly illustrates that the promise of stem cell therapy for MS still requires research to understand how to deliver that therapy so that we get the results that we want. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things we learned at the Ectrams conference, you'll want to join me next week on Real Talk MS when my guest is going to be Bruce Bebo, the Executive Vice President of Research at the National MS Society, and Bruce and I sit down to do our annual Ectrams Review. Managing MS becomes much more complex when you're also living with another unrelated health condition. These other conditions are called comorbidities, and managing or avoiding comorbidities makes living with MS easier. In a moment, we'll meet my guest, Dr. Alyssa Willis, and we're talking about how comorbidities can impact MS and what you can do to avoid them. Research shows that more than 50% of the people living with MS will experience another chronic health condition over their lifetime. These additional health conditions are known as comorbidities, and we're talking about comorbidities and MS with Dr. Alyssa Willis, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Willis. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me here um, today to talk about living well with multiple sclerosis. Can you tell us what these comorbidities, these other conditions might be and how they might affect someone's MS? Well, John, having multiple sclerosis doesn't give anyone a free pass from having other conditions and comorbid conditions, just simply other health conditions that someone has. The top five comorbid conditions that, that people with multiple sclerosis report are depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and chronic lung disease. But people with MS can have any comorbid condition. The more conditions someone has, it can delay the diagnosis for multiple sclerosis. Um, it can also increase the risk for, dis for earlier disability with, with MS. 
Of course, more comorbid conditions means that the quality of life is impacted, sometimes as a direct result of those other conditions, but sometimes as a result of the medications and all of the other things that are needed to manage those conditions. Does having another health condition, a comorbidity in addition to MS, make the MS itself worse? Well, John, we still don't know the answer to that question directly. So we don't know that for certain comorbid conditions, for example, depression, does it have a direct effect on multiple sclerosis? We think not, but that, that, that is, it's very difficult to untangle in practice. Um, what we do know is that people who are healthy overall do better from an MS standpoint. So the best approach is, is, to, is to try to develop and maintain a healthy lifestyle and prevent the conditions in the first place. It occurs to me that even if a comorbid morbid condition doesn't make the MS worse, it doesn't seem like it would be much of a help in terms of overall quality of life. That's, that's absolutely right. So um, whether a condition directly impacts the control of the MS or not, it certainly doesn't help in, in either managing the MS disease itself or all of the symptoms that go with having multiple sclerosis. In developing comorbidities, how much of a factor is age? So um, it's true that as people age, in general, they have a higher risk for comorbid conditions, whether they have multiple sclerosis or not. We know that the, the risk for certain conditions like heart disease, cholesterol, high cholesterol, um, osteoporosis or thin bones increases as people age. We also know that the risk for infection increases as people age. This presents you know, unique challenges um, in, for someone who has multiple sclerosis. So if you're on an MS medication and you're aging and you have an increased risk for infections, this is very relevant to your day-to-day -day life and, and what we need to do from an MS standpoint in preventing you from getting sick. You know, we often talk about making healthy lifestyle choices, but for a moment, Let's talk about the flip side of that coin and talk about some of the unhealthy lifestyle choices that people do elect. Uh, for instance, how does being overweight affect MS and other comorbidities? So, John, we know that there's a correlation between childhood obesity and risk for developing MS. We don't have uh, strong data looking at the correlation between obesity and the severity of MS or MS disease activity in adults, but we do know that being overweight or obese increases the risk for comorbid conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis. So, you know, for people with multiple sclerosis who are already having difficulty getting around, for example, the excess weight further limits physical activity in, and then further increases the risk for developing some of those com comorbid conditions like high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes. And what about things like smoking or drinking alcohol? What sort of effect do, do those behaviors have on MS and comorbidities? So, John, we have the best data for um, for smoking in and multiple sclerosis, and in, in the sense that um, smoking may increase the risk for disability with multiple sclerosis. It seems to be um, contribute to the risk for developing multiple sclerosis in the first place, but we don't have a clear linkage between cigarette smoking and relapse rate in MS. We also have clear data in the general population that smoking increases the risk for comorbid conditions, um, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, things that could further impact someone who has multiple sclerosis. As far as alcohol consumption in, in MS, um, there are individual situations in which people shouldn't drink alcohol at all. Medication interactions are, are a good example. But if we're looking at all comers and, and thinking about alcohol consumption, if someone chooses to drink, they should at least drink in moderation. So moderation by CDC recommendations is no more than two drinks per day for a man and no more than one drink per day for a woman. The best approach is, is, is abstinence from alcohol. Um, but if someone does choose to use alcohol, they should um, place limits so that they're, they're not having unhealthy alcohol consumption, which increases the, the risk for mood disorders and also increases the risk long term for things like cancer. Now let's spend a moment talking about those healthier lifestyle choices. Diet and nutrition, we hear about them a lot in the news. What is their real impact on MS and comorbidities? 
Well, John, diet and nutrition are not exactly the same thing, although we can use those terms interchangeably. Um, diet is what we eat and how we eat it. And nutrition has more to do with the vitamin, mineral, calorie composition of, of, the, of the foods that we take in as part of our diet. There are lots of things out there that call themselves the MS diet. And there are some diets that have been studied specifically in people with multiple sclerosis, but we don't have one clear diet that's better than another. So in general, a healthy diet for someone with multiple sclerosis would include lean proteins over red meat. So choosing turkey, fish, chicken, where possible, um, plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, limited alcohol, limited salt. These things are, um, these, these, diet recommendations are important in preventing other comorbid conditions from developing. And if we're talking diet and nutrition, we should probably also be talking about exercise and lifestyle physical activity as a way of maybe reducing some of the risk of developing those comorbidities. What's a good definition for exercise and lifestyle physical activity? And is there a difference between those two terms? So physical activity is so important for people with multiple sclerosis. Years and years ago, MS specialists would recommend that people with multiple sclerosis not exercise, that they would, quote unquote, take it easy. We know now that this is really bad advice. People with MS should be active. Uh, uh, physical activity has a, has a number of health benefits. Beyond just preventing comorbid conditions, um, physical activity can improve mood. And it can improve some of the other symptoms that go with MS. It's much easier to manage your, your bladder and believe it or not, your fatigue if you're physically active. People sleep better when they get physical activity during the day. There are differences between exercise and, and lifestyle physical activity in the sense that exercise is usually scheduled and it's intentional. It's that um, going to the gym kind of thing that you may think of, whereas lifestyle physical activity includes all of the things that you do vacuuming the house, walking around at your work, um, taking, taking a walk with a dog. Those are examples of, of lifestyle physical activity, and both are important. Um, you know, what, what someone with multiple sclerosis needs depends on their, their overall health, and it, it depends on their, their overall abilities. But in general, people with multiple sclerosis should be physically active. It has a number of health benefits. One of the things that I often hear from people living with MS is exercise sounds great, but I'm so fatigued before I even start that I don't know how to get through the exercise. What advice do you have for them? So the, the best advice I, that I have for that very common situation is to start with just a little bit of activity, be consistent with it, and then slowly increase an example would be for someone who's who has severe fatigue and they're not exercising, commit to doing five minutes, five minutes. It doesn't matter what it is. A five minute walk um, could be five minutes up and down the driveway to the mailbox and back and set your alarm on your phone or microwave or egg timer if you have one of those things. But set something that makes you stop. Even if you're feeling well at the end of that five minute mark, stop. Make sure that you have good time for recovery. And if you can do that same amount of physical activity each day for at least five days that week, then the next week you can bump it up a little bit. Go from five to seven and a half minutes. And week by week, you can gradually increase to the point that you can do 30 minutes a day. And you'll notice that with that approach, um, your, your fatigue level actually reduces and it adjusts um, if you don't overdo it to the point that you need several days to recover. Sometimes a change in your health might seem like it's part of MS, and sometimes a change in your health might actually be something entirely new or different, a, a comorbidity. How should someone go about determining whether they're dealing with a new or worsening MS symptom or whether they're dealing with something else? John, you are spot on. It can be so difficult to tell when someone has worsening symptoms whether it's related to multiple sclerosis or it's an indication that something else is going on in the body. In general, if, if there are new neurologic symptoms, that's likely to be multiple sclerosis related. If it's worsening of old stuff, it's usually an indication that something else is going on. Could be an infection, it could be overexertion, it could be emotional stress. Anything that stresses the body makes injured nerves not work as well. A good rule of thumb is whether they're new symptoms or worsening symptoms, if they've been there for at least 24 hours, your neurology care team is a good place to start. 
call, find out, is this MS or is it not MS related? Um, believe it or not, it can, it can be hard for even healthcare providers to sort out the difference between MS and not MS related. But a good place to start is if it's there for at least 24 hours, go ahead and give your neurology team a call. And then they can work with you to sort out next steps and sorting out whether, you know, this is a new MS thing or something else is going on, maybe a bladder infection. Some of these other health conditions may actually require treatment from other medical specialists outside of your MS care team. What can a patient do to ensure that all of their treating health care providers are actually talking to each other? This can be very challenging, especially if your health care providers are not part of the same network. So if they are, if you're in one of those situations where you're lucky enough that all of your healthcare team is, is, is at the same institution or part of the same network, the electronic medical record is a powerful tool to make sure that everyone stays in communication. Um, we can read each other's notes. We can exchange messages electronically. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, to consolidate your healthcare into one healthcare system, that's one way to do it. If, you, if you're not that lucky, if you don't have that opportunity, identify one member of your healthcare team to be sort of your quarterback. This is usually your primary care doctor, or it could be your neurologist, but this person is the person that links everyone else together. You'll want to make sure that this person knows everyone who's taking care of you, and at the end of your visits, communicates to the rest of the team what's going on. What's the best strategy or defense for someone living with MS against developing comorbidities in the future? So the best strategy is to have a healthy lifestyle and stay healthy overall. Just because you have MS, your MS doesn't have to have you. Um, remember that you're more than just a, a, a bundle of nerves. I mean, you're a whole person and taking care of your, uh, yourself as a whole person is very important. If you do that, if you have a healthy lifestyle and you see your primary care provider for routine health maintenance, the chances that you'll develop other comorbid conditions that worsen your health and worsen your MS are lower. Well, Dr. Alyssa Willis, thank you for all you do to improve the lives of people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. You bet. Thanks for the opportunity, John. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 217. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. This week's episode of the MS Caregiver Conundrum goes live Thursday morning when I'll be talking about the Embracing Carers Initiative with Lynn Taylor, the Senior Vice President and Head of Global Healthcare Government and Public Affairs at EMD Serono. We'll also be taking a look at some of the eye-opening caregiver research that EMD Serono has conducted, and we'll ask Lynn why a large biopharmaceutical company is so invested in caregivers. You'll find the MS Caregiver Conundrum at mscaregiverconundrum.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I hope you'll give this episode a listen. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.